It's often said that you never get a second chance at a first impression, but is it possible to get a second chance at life? Welcome to Haviland Friends. I'm your host, Haviland Malone, and every week I bring you inside my amazing world of mindfulness teachers, inspirational speakers, business experts, celebrities, and so much more to have the conversations that matter to you. And today's guest is one of New Orleans' most influential life skills and community development professionals who knows a thing or two about second chances. After receiving a 15-year prison sentence and leaving with public service in mind, this gentleman started an organization to be able to give second chances through Sharp Men. He's also a training manager with the New Orleans Business Alliance and a Class 2 Kellogg's Fellow. I'm so excited to be able to introduce my friend, Patrick Young. Hey, Patrick. Yo, what's up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so excited to have you on today. You know, when people like meet you, they get a chance to interact with you, talk with you, like the impression that they get is this, you know, distinguished gentleman, you know, well dressed, well spoken. And people would have no idea that there was a story behind this glory and all the work that you're doing now in the community. So I want you to just share a little bit because I think a lot of times we are faced with you know, things that happen within our youth or things that we go through in life that present themselves as challenges that sometimes can stop us from moving into our next level. But you are literally living proof that anything is possible. So I want you to share a little bit about, you know, what happened in your teenage years. Well, um, first, thank you for having me on the show. I'm so excited for being here. Uh, uh, it's an honor to do anything. So I thank you for all the work that you're doing. And it's kind of like what you're doing now and fighting for those schools. And, you know, you have these kids that are just part of the system and it's important for someone to come and save them, right? Or to come and help and be there. And we expect adults to be there. So when you grow up, um, you know, I'm from New Orleans, you know, uh, my mom raised so four boys. We lived in the East and, Growing up, we had to save ourselves. There was really nobody to come for us other than my mom, you know? And so uh, as brothers, we grew up pretty close. And so pretty much after high school, uh, my brother was, my older brother was murdered. And I think that really kind of took a toll on me. So in 1997, my brother was killed. He was found uh, in Houston on the side of a road. And so at the time, being in college and trying to focus on, you know, just doing what I'm supposed to do, you know, go to college and, and, and be this person that, you know, you, you're taught to be. I lost it, you know, and, and I, in losing my brother, I really lost myself. And I think that another thing that we're doing and what we deal with is the identity crisis of, one, not having a father, two, losing the, the brother that's close to you, who you admire, you look up to, he's murdered. Um, and so everything that mattered, school, family, um, I didn't know who I was. And then the mental health of when you have a pain or a trauma of experience of losing a loss like that, we don't, you know, you don't go talk to counselors. They say uh, in our community growing up, you know, black people don't go to counseling, right? And pastor just say, pastor Absolutely. Say, I think, I think that, that is such a great way. point is that so many times, especially within our community, you know, when we're dealing with tragedies, we're dealing with tough times, and then we don't go seek help because it's shunned upon or thought like, oh, no, no, like black people don't do that. You know? Well, really, I'm just saying black people, I think primarily black men, like we are supposed to take that, right? If, if, a, if a woman or a mother or a parent or someone like that, they go to counseling, oh, it's okay, it's, 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 it's okay. But if as a man, you crazy, something's wrong with you. And to have that stigma, um, not being strong and not being uh, psych, um, having the mental capacity to deal with whatever is going on, it's something has to be major wrong with you. And so you grow up with all those type of stigmas and things that you're trying to do. And uh, when really, no, I'm hurt. Like this hurts me, it affects me, right? And it'll help me through this, this hurt. And so if there's no example, and at the time there's really no, there was no one I could have turned to you and say, well, hey, um, I'm feeling a certain way, help me out. 
And what happened is instead of turning to professional help, I turned to um, the worst kind of help <laughs> that you can find. <laughs> and which was, was substance, you know, and trying to uh, alcohol and, you know, getting that liquor confidence of day to day, um, just trying to survive. But anyway, um, ultimately, I just landed in a bad spot where I'm sitting in uh, prison, figuring like how, like, because it happened like in a blink of an eye. My brother died. I'm dealing with this pain. And then before you know it, it's almost like a Wizard of Oz thing. You wake up in a prison with 15 years. And you're trying to figure out what does that look like. So in uh, 1998, I was convicted. Uh, I was sent to Angela, Louisiana. So I don't know if you know about Angela, Louisiana, but that's the home of the Ku Klux Klan. And so, oh, wow. uh, yeah. So I had a, a a real awakening. And but it was a I knew. Um, I'm gonna tell you the best thing about it was losing my brother. I had to find who I was. I had to find out who Patrick was. Not who my mother wanted me to be, not who uh, the schools or teachers or parents, or people who said I, I was this person. I really had to find who I was in myself. And so I think that that awakening, um, it's kind of like in the Bible where they talk about the, uh, the son and he uh, is in his pit, the prodigal son and he's in a pit or something like that, right? And um, there's a verse where he says, and he came to himself. And so it was for me in that moment of just being able to come to myself and really redefine and redesign and really look at who I was and who I wanted to be. And from that moment on, it was, it was, it was, it was full steam ahead. And so I think that's really helping. To that, I think we all like come to those like pivotal moments and thank you so much for sharing that because I, I think so many of us like come to that point in life where we face that identity crisis where either tragic circumstances happen, it could be, you know, the loss of a loved one, job loss, you know, relationship loss, you know, something that happens um, or even going from one environment to another, like you go from, you know, living in your parents' home and now you have to build a life for yourself and you're trying to figure out who am I, what am I, because we're programmed with growing up, you know, certain identities or certain stigmas as to how you should or should not be. But you come to that place where it's like, who am I really? Or what do I want to be in my life? And as you say, sometimes when we're coping or trying to cope with difficult situations in life, we try to find something to help us cope. So if we don't reach out for the, the help that we need, then we'll turn to substances. We'll turn to, you know, um, out um, the behaviors that are kind of like outcries and sometimes lead to troubled situations. So I love the fact that you're able to share that, hey, you know what, I got to that place and I, and I, I had that identity crisis. But in that, there was some jewels, there was some seeds that right. have now blossomed into something else. And so I want you to so share about, because you went into or made a decision for yourself that you wanted to go into public service, that you wanted to be able to use your life where it meant something and you can help other people. And you even did that from behind bars. And so immediately um, you, you don't, you know, sometimes you don't, if you have a gift, you don't even want it sometimes. Like, it's like, a, give it to somebody else, right? And so yes. I'm in <laughs> dealing with my stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, my assignment was, I was a GED teacher and I'm trying to teach people to read and I'm trying to help guys. And in the, in the same time, I'm like, well, hey, wait, uh, I need to work on me. But the gift is telling you, no, you have to teach, you have to improve other people and make it better for them. And I'm like, wait, and I'm trying to be selfish with my stuff. Like, can I say that? I wanted to be, but uh, what I realized was that, man, um, like over 80% of the prison can read above a fifth grade level. Um, and then I immediately went into literacy to help guys couldn't even write letters home. Uh, a lot of times cases were being overturned simply because they couldn't even read uh, what they were even convicted of. Like, imagine that. I mean, being. And so in this space, it's like, you know what? Let me 
you know, and once I, I committed to, well, to the selfless act of saying, you know what, this is bigger than me. Um, and while I'm here, let me just grow into whatever I need to be. But I know that right now I'm called to do this work. I'm called to um, help this education, help guys improve their standing. And it's from the alchemist. It says, when you love yourself, you will start to become better. But when you become better, everything is around you becomes better as well. So part of my transition was I have to make everything around me better as well. And so um, started teaching. That, that, that mindset is literally like living your legacy. Um, I remember Judy Williamson from the Napoleon Hill Foundation when we worked together on the, the children's version of Think and Grow Rich. She told me, she was like, anything that you want to keep, you got to share. Anything right. you want to keep, you got to share it. Because even as it is going out of your lips, as it is going out of your soul, your spirit, it is also coming back into you and it's being reinstilled in you. And so the fact that you answered that call and it was like, wait, 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 I, I, I want to do something for my own improvement. But it's like, no, because of where your assignment was going to bring you and the level at which you were going to serve people and help people and, and what you're doing now, you had to start then serving. And, and, Wow. <laughs> we started in a, so I started, a, we were part of an organization inside the institution called JC's, United Junior Chamber of Commerce. To this day, I'm the only inmate, I was the only inmate at the time in the state of Louisiana to be appointed to a state board. Yeah, uh, we would do giveaways. <laughs> we would donate to United Way. We started uh, sign language. We started legal classes. We started Hispanic uh, language classes. Um, and it was just like you started seeing this momentum in this ship. Over 250 uh, individuals got their GED. Uh, we started college readiness training. So by the time I left, um, I had moved from being a GED to the college prep teacher. So we was teaching asset prep, which is college uh, and math prep classes. And I mean, you really just started seeing a, a big shift. And that's when I really started thinking about, you know, all right, I get them. The mathematics of this thing is, um, like you said, for me to um, grow, then I have to also plant seeds elsewhere. Yes. And in that, that's where the multiplication comes in, right? And then when they say you reap what you sow, it underst I understood it now. Oh, okay. And sometimes we look at that connotation as a negative sense. But if you're sowing good seed, right? And then, you know, everything that comes, hey, I appreciate it. Yes, and that led to you doing some amazing work with like Strive New Orleans and being able to help individuals who had been previously incarcerated to make that transition and get the training, the job skills training, the, the interview skills, you know, all of the, the life skills that are necessary because just because this has been your past doesn't mean it has to be your present or your future and really being able to instill that and working as a training manager with the New Orleans Business Alliance and creating the programs that are necessary. But you also saw another need. You saw where there was a gap in, in needs. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about your nonprofit organization, Sharp Men. So great. Um, so as yourself, you know, you're a fashionable lady, you be looking fly, right? Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chad. So, stylist. Look. <laughs> yeah. So in the um in our community, uh, especially in New Orleans, dress success has been around for 20 years, and which has supported and empowered women just by suiting, right? Just a simple outfit where a woman can go to get professional attire. She has an interview or work readiness, and she just needs some assistance. Well, uh, with the training we were doing with Strive, we saw that we were able to get the connection, you know, make the transition of getting someone prepared for the job. But when it's time to interview, we were having to pull and scrape and trying to find different pieces for the men. And it wasn't a complete package. And so after thinking about saying, well, what can we do? Or who can we talk to? Again, that calling was like, no, you do it. I was like, wait, no, we're not trying to spend my money. We to <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and so often we see a need and we're like, somebody should fix this. Should like, be doing it. Right. And you think, listen, Dress Success, amazing organization, 150 cities and 30 countries. Let's keep that in mind. And currently 
There are only two other organizations, Men's Fit in New York. New York and um, in DC, there's an organization that does it, right? But um, where in the South, in New Orleans, in, Louis, in, in Texas, in Atlanta, where is this service to help these men, especially with the high incarcerated population, guys who want to go on interviews, where is this assistance? And it just came that, hey, we just need to do it. And we're just modeling the same example for address success, but we want to do it for men. Simple. I mean, I'm not trying to complicate it. I don't want to start a new Urban League chapter. That's not what I'm doing. I'm a refer, refer, refer. But if there are young men who need uh, personal branding advice, who need a suit, who need shoes, belts, the whole nine, that, that's what we want to provide. It's called Sharp. Look sharp, think sharp, stay sharp. Um, your first impression is your first advantage. Because if you look at, if you have an interview, it said that 65% of employers automatically look at how you show up. And so if I can show up and I get a check for my appearance, I'm already in the advantage. So your first appearance, your first, you know, you know, and, and there's a science. I even found the science of if you look good, you feel good. Like most definitely so much data around when you're depressed, you dress down. Right? If you're unemployed and you can't find a job, you're not gonna wear a suit because you don't feel entitled to even wear that. But then when you get a brand new suit, brand new shirt, brand new tie, and you hold your chest up. Right. It's like, it's, ah, you know, yeah, religiously. An absolute, like, mind body connection to every aspect of our right. life. And when we do feel confident, you're going to dress more confidently. When you feel right. confident, you're going to speak more, you know, eloquently. You're going to, like, assert yourself a little bit more. And all of those things are cues because communication, when you talk about words, that's only what, like, seven percent of communication like body language your the tone of your voice the physical appearance all of those things are also communicating a message and when you can set yourself up for success in the way that you appear and, and i love that you know there's an extraordinary organization dress for success that like is very much uh, catered to women and helping them to look and feel their best. And now there's resources available to men because men need that help too. So tell people how they can get in contact with your organization if they either want to be able to um, donate in some way or to help in some way or if they need the services themselves. Please reach out. We're at uh, sharpmen.org. Um, all our links on media is at Sharpmen NOLA. Uh, we're looking to expand eventually in a few years. We'll be in your city. So if you're interested in us coming to a different city, uh, because again, uh, as we empower women, we should want to desire to build just as strong young boys into strong young men. Um, I would just want to give a quick example. Apple gives us one of the best examples of this whole idea. So um, if you have your phone, it's going to do this update. So every three to four months, your phone updates. So it's improving itself internally. So after it makes so many updates internally, it's gonna say, you know, it's time for an upgrade. And the upgrade means externally, I look better. I'm designed better, right? And so we're saying that you're ready for an interview, you're ready for work, you're making those updates to yourself to improve yourself. Now externally, let's upgrade you, right? You can't be an iPhone 4 and an iPhone X world. We have to, yo, know, like you can't be a flip phone. Right. And so we have to get you to the space where you're able to perform at the level of the expectation. And the look is a part of that as well. And so um, that. that's such a beautiful example because the, the times are advancing so fast with technology, with global outreach, with, you know, so many opportunities that are present. But you also have to be prepared for the opportunities that yeah. are available. And the, and the look is a part of that where you feel comfortable you feel confident and you're able to perform at your best and so thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the community to be able to help individuals to live their best life like literally and and i also want to congratulate you um, 
exciting news that I want to be able to like uh, for you to be able to share with everyone about being a part of the class two Kellogg's fellowship. <laughs> wow. Uh, same thing I said. Uh, um, Kellogg has this amazing program, the WKKF uh, Community Leadership Network Fellowship, um, where out of 800 people, 80 were selected across the country to figure out what we can do and come up together as leaders and really help our community. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm so honored to be chosen as one of those thought leaders around bringing this back to the community. Um, and, and it's really just an opportunity for me to continue to grow, to continue to uh, find ways to find new seeds so I can plant more seeds so more people can come back into it. I'm just, I mean, it's just, again, it goes back to um, when you want better for yourself, you strive to become better. Everything around you becomes better as well. So these are some of those things that are coming back, but ultimately just for me to continue to work to make other people better around me. And so, mm, I love that. And thank you again for just the amazing work that you're doing in the community. Like you are literally proof that anything is possible, second chances are possible, and that the seeds that we plant can reap some really tremendous fruit. And we know that when we share our stories, we get to live, to learn, and love a little bit more. And I want you to be proof of what's possible. I'm your host, Haviland Malone, and I can't wait to see you all next week on another episode of Haviland Friends. We'll see you later. Yeah.